We humans always have to consider the inevitability of death, the future of loss, the waiting game, the grand time limit, everyone dies eventually. But the real question is, would not dying be any better? As regular humans, we'd never be able to know the answer to that, but Genshin's Conrians may provide us with some fascinating insight. Today, I want to ask the question of, why curse the Conrians with immortality and not just kill them? Disclaimer, for the purposes of this theory, the scope and limitations of this video will be that the gods did the Curse of Conria. I know that there are theories out there that the Curse of Immortality is an alchemical curse or artificially done, but I'll be tackling this from the perspective that the gods did it for the sake of internal consistency. Okay, we'll talk about the Chalk Mother next time. Let's begin theorizing on what the Curse of Immortality even is. When talking about the actual mechanics and restrictions of the Curse of Immortality, there is actually a surprising amount of nuance that we need to take into account because Genshin tackles multiple forms of immortality. The word immortal has been so obscure that there's even sublevels to it. Creatures with long lifespans that can't die of natural causes such as age are also called immortal. But those creatures can be killed through natural means such as a good old stab to the chest. Conrians, on the other hand, who are cursed with immortality, have shown no or slower signs of aging, as they sleep remains the same through both cutscenes before and during present time. In 3.5, he is still depicted to be the same even though this encounter should have been several decades, if not centuries ago. Piero, though, does look quite worn and definitely much older than your standard Genshin Impact male, but I think there's a possibility that he's always been this age, considering his status as a royal mage. We do need some confirmation for that, that we unfortunately don't have at the moment. We do also know that creatures cursed with immortality retain their intelligence, as opposed to those cursed into monsters. Honestly, now that I'm really thinking about it, I am sincerely beginning to doubt Clother's claim that pure-blooded people were given the worst punishment because just think of the unfortunate counterpart. But a theoretical difference between divine immortality and the curse of immortality could be that the gods also cursed them with undeath, as in the inability to die, not just an inhuman lifespan or eternal life. Creatures cursed were quote-unquote robbed with any chance of release, meaning that it's possible that their form of immortality is actually a grander form of invulnerability, meaning that they can not only die from natural causes like time and illness, but also unpredictable causes like murder or injury. This is because the ultimate question would just be, why can't creatures cursed with immortality just kill themselves if they want to? Even the slimmest chance of release would entice someone that deems immortality as a curse. And I think the gods would take that possibility into account and just disallow them altogether. I covered this in my previous video about the afterlife, and that there's a popular theory going around that the heavenly principles are the ones that cursed them, or more specifically, that there exists a shade of life and death that preceded all life in the universe. People began theorizing that because the four shades were the ones that created human life from the book before sun and moon, they could have also preserved human life for an indeterminate amount of time by disallowing death altogether. This isn't actually completely unheard of because we see a very similar concept of temporary theoretical immortality through Farazan. Her body was locked in an almost stasis-like pause where she felt no bodily need of hunger or thirst, but her mind was still being withered away by the mental stress as the hours and years passed her by. It's very much possible that the Conrians are playing by very similar rules. Now for the question of why wouldn't Nai divine perfect invulnerability be considered as a good thing? Well, one thing is that erosion is still very much a concept that every mortal has to go through, as in the very slow yet constant eradication of one's memory, will, and psyche. But another one is… um… Now comes the important question. Why curse the pure-blooded Conrians with immortality, and why the pure-blooded Conrians only? Well, Clother says that it was because the pure-blooded Conrians are considered the greater sinners of the two groups, while those that only migrated to Conria but were originally creatures of the Vat were turned into monsters. But the real question is, why not just kill them? Well, I can think of several reasons for choosing immortality as a worse punishment. One is preventing leyline pollution. One possibility that the gods refrained from killing the pure-blooded Conrians besides questionable moral justice was because of the possibility they could be tainted after the first cataclysm with Rhyndaughter's monsters. Conria, prior to the cataclysm, was already riddled with the energies of forbidden knowledge, even called by Nahida as polluted. 
It's not really confirmed that the citizens themselves were tainted, but if we use King Deshard's civilization as an example, forbidden knowledge can pass on from entity to entity, then entity to leyline connection. We are not sure to what extent the pollution rises though, but what if the gods refrained from killing them so their life force never merges with the leylines, or at least so that they eradicate the possibility of them polluting the leylines in the first place? Genshin has a difference with ghosts and memory ghosts created by the leylines, but we do know that when something impure is dead, it can leave horrible backlash and residue that could poison the area around it unless those energies are properly purified. The problem is that celestial energy is antithetical to abyssal energy, and that there is no true form of purification that we know about at the moment except for maybe the traveler's abilities. So it's possible that they let them erode naturally to hopefully expunge the otherworldly energy through time, or at least until their entire life force disintegrates and extinguishes. Or maybe they're just playing the long game because, again, there's no true form of purification of abyssal energy. Genshin uses the concept of soul as a very tangible afterimage of both consciousness and whatever lingering life essence there exists in a person. Souls linger and can carry on memories of their previous life, which is why we see ghosts and spirits lingering about as both a result of leyline problems or actual spiritual mumbo-jumbo. But we can also see remnants. Divine creatures, for example, are able to leave behind powerful remnants of their power and also pollute the entire nation. Liyue, for example, had to employ the help of the Yakshas in expunging the demons from the land. This is partially because not only did the bodies of the gods have powerful energies, but also because it would directly affect the ley lines and the borders of the afterlife. Wu Tao plays off the whole border thing as a joke and a fairy tale, but Xiao's active role as a Yaksha drives home the gravity of the situation prior to the restoration of the balance, and that there became a need after the Archon War to separate life and death. The immortalization of the Conrians would be a weird prevention method though, but Celestia has never been truly one to call mercy. Number 2 is Psychological Warfare. We saw how devastating the entire cataclysm was, not just from the perspective of the Devatians whose homes were invaded, but also to the Conrians who lost everything. Honestly, you can completely disregard everything I previously said about woo the good of the world or woo the afterlife. No, Sastia could definitely just have done it for the sake of maximum torment. Consider the fact that your homeland was completely devastated, your family either immortal as well or even worse, life as you know it was turned upside down and you're forced to wander forever with the constant threat of erosion. Add that with the even scarier possibility that you can't be killed or see the sweet release of death. That would just absolutely ruin someone emotionally. It's also extremely messed up when you consider the fact that they still gave them their original awareness and intelligence. There is a very odd saying that exists in psychology that maximum pain is only truly achieved when the subject acknowledges the pain and is intelligent enough to comprehend it. Which is why pain inflicted on creatures who are smart enough to squeal or cry or to react invoke either a sense of empathy or enjoyment, depending on the spectator. The monsters didn't have the luxury of being fully conscious when they went through the transition, and even less so throughout their time in Devant. For all intents and purposes, the monsters that the non-pure bloods became were just empty husks of themselves. Contrast that to those that are actively alive and decaying with each passing year, those who are conscious enough to actually feel the years pass them by. I definitely wouldn't put it past Lestia to just put Torment as a motivator for this curse. And for my last theory on why immortality instead of murder, let's go with the opposite possibility. What if it was a shrewd and desperate way of saving the people of Conria from the first cataclysm? Yes, this is absolutely a messed up way of thinking about it, but consider the cards we have on the table for a moment. The people of Conria were cursed with nigh-perfect immortality, while those who defected from existing nations were cursed to be monsters. While Clother says that it's because the Conrians were greater sinners, the disparity is evident. It's not an equivalent exchange whatsoever. So what if, just what if, the curse of immortality wasn't made to be a curse at all? What if the gods just wanted to find the best way of keeping the Conrians alive and they believed that immortality, or at least longevity, was the best possible consolation for the devastation of their nation at the hands of the nobles and the sages? Pfft, nah. Honestly? It would just be so much simpler if the gods led them to a whole out extinction. They should have killed all the Conrians when they had the chance. That way, there'd be an absolute guarantee that there would be no revenge plot, no encore or repetition of the cataclysm to come. I even genuinely believe that by not killing the Conrians, they've created an even bigger problem for Tevat. 
because now you have a whole demographic potentially dead set on revenge with the needed knowledge to do so. I mean, that's basically what the Abyss Order is, previous Conrians or supporters who became mesmerized by the Abyss's power fueled by potential years worth of life. Whether they intended to or not, Celestia made their worst enemy imaginable, which surprises me because this isn't the first time there was a forbidden knowledge pollution in Tivat. We didn't really see the measures that they took when purging the world of King Deshret's actions, but immortality wasn't one of them. Granted, that society crumbled and destroyed itself much sooner before the nail, I wonder where Celestia even got the idea that giving immortality to the people whose homes you destroyed was a good thing. But what if it isn't even immortality? Well, that's a theory for another day. My name is Astrid, thank you for chilling with me. And speaking of chilling with me, I've started a new interactive V podcast over on Twitch where I just talk about random topics about media, society, and just whatever interests you and me. So head on over to Live with Aster for some random conversations. And honestly, just some much needed relaxation and rants. Anyway, that's it. See ya.